Juggernaut. I decided to drag a few boxes into the house and start sifting through. Let's get the biggest thing out of the way. This. An expert accelerator sales race winner, Xbox expert. Back in the early 2000s when the Xbox was first launched, my job was a assistant manager for a video game company. And the Xbox came out and the distribute box um, basically ran this competition throughout the entire United Kingdom. And the winner got to drive around a race course um, called Browns Hatch. And they also got themselves an Xbox and a year's supply of games. Out of the entire UK, we were the highest selling store for, for Xbox products. We were the best sellers of Xbox. Um, what, what it entailed is basically we had to tally our sales. They declared our company and me as the winner. Hooray! And as a commemoration, I got this plaque. It's signed here by um, Dean Van Helsen, who was the head of marketing and uh, Rachel Birch, who was the channel marketing manager. Uh, it's got the Xbox logos there, it's got one of the cars we got to drive, everything's there um, for 2002 sales race. So that is very hard to come by, only three in the UK, and I own one of them. I'm glad to see that's, you know, survived the damage. This one is further programming for the ZX Spectrum. Ian Stewart and Robin Jones. It taught you basic programming knowledge, how to draw characters on screen, random, how to randomize stuff, like a built-in clock, uh, variable lengths, statistics, you can make software on statistics. All in these awesome early, well, early 80s stroke late 90s fonts. It's really cool. I mean, look at that font style there on the header. Ain't that grand to see a book printed like that? And it's also got these little comic cartoons on the back. <laughs> Very cool. Here's another book. This is less exciting. This is the introduction to the ZX Spectrum. This is the basic book that came with the ZX Spectrum. It gives you very brief overviews on how to do simple commands for the Spectrum. The ZX Spectrum and how to get the most from it by Ian Sinclair. Not Clive Sinclair, Ian Sinclair teaches you how to do simple things like grids. Some very interesting cool software in here. You can do string action, um, how to pull uh, data and save data. Just, just general interesting early programming. How to draw basic graphics. Yeah, pretty cool. That's the end of the books. <clears throat> And this is the first major casualty for the uh, for the video. Sega Rally, um, Sega Rally 2, to be precise, for the PC. Um, <clears throat> the box was absolutely trashed. It's in pieces, but the discs seem all right. Hopefully, that will still work. Fingers crossed. <clears throat> What will definitely still work is Paperboy. Paperboy for the Sega Master System. It's in a clamshell case, so I have no doubt that this is going to be fully functional. The cartridge is fine, spick and span. I'm sure that's going to work the first time I plug it in. Paperboy, of course, is a superb conversion of the arcade classic. One of my favourite Master System games ever. It's, it's just super cool, and I'm so glad it's still here. Another one I'm so glad is still here is Golden Axe Warrior, which was featured on my top 50 Sega Master System games. This is a ripoff, homage, whatever you want to call it, of Nintendo's Zelda series. Um, it's very well done. In many ways, I kind of prefer it to Zelda. The graphics are a lot neater for a start, um, and the characters seem to be more interesting. But it seems like the box wasn't fully closed because. This is, um, it's it's suffered a bit of damp on the manual there. Uh, it's a bit faded, a bit jaded. Uh, but the cartridge looks in absolute mint condition. There's not even any dust in there. 
Golden Axe Warrior. I'm pretty sure will work the moment I plug that into my Master System. Or my Mega Base Converter for the Sega Mega Drive. Okay, moving on. Doom for the 32X. Needs no introduction, really. Doom is a seminal classic. The 32X version was one of the few console versions of the game released in 1994. If you wanted to play Doom and you didn't own a PC in 94, you either bought a 32X or you bought an Atari Jaguar. That was it. Later versions did come along for the 3DO, the PlayStation, the Sega Saturn, everything else under the sun. But in the early days, you could only get this on 32X and the Jaguar. So, funny story, I wanted a 32X. No, um, I wanted a 32X just to play Doom. I bought a 32X and Doom, took it home, and it failed on me. It just froze solid, and it kept freezing. Uh, it froze with every game I tried. I had Doom, I had Virtua Racing Deluxe, and I basically couldn't run either of them for more than 10 minutes without it crashing my machine. So I took it back to the shop and got a refund. And do you know what I spent that refund on? An Atari Jaguar with Doom. And that was an amazing decision. Ignore what people say about the Atari Jaguar. It may not be a decent competitor to something like this, the, uh, the PlayStation or the Saturn, but it had some fun games and I thoroughly enjoyed playing Doom on it. Virtua Fighter for the 32X. Now this is a great conversion. Um, considering the system's limitations, they managed to pull off not only a game that looked like a decent replica of the arcade game, but it actually played in many respects better than the arcade game. In fact, it even improved upon the Sega Saturn by adding some new modes uh, in this game, uh, in this version of the game. Um, the sound may not be quite up to scratch because there's no CD audio, but the game plays here in spades. Virtua Fighter 32X, absolute must own game if you have a 32X. If you see one cheap, grab it. And while you're at it, Grab Star Wars Arcade as well, will you? That's another brilliant, absolute must-have game for the 32X. Absolutely fantastic conversion of an absolutely fantastic arcade game. Star Wars Arcade just... Ah, it's just great. It's just absolutely great. You can spend forever just blasting those TIE Fighters with its primitive 3D graphics. But those 3D graphics, which may look really primitive by today's standards, were the shiznit when it came out. It absolutely blew away any other console game that was released at the time. Still good fun. As is Virtua Racing Deluxe. Now, I did mention this earlier. I had a 32X. I got it refunded got an Atari Jaguar, and then later in life bought another 32X. So this is the actual copy I've owned for, oof, must be going on 21 years now. Still in great condition despite everything that my collection's been through in terms of damp and water damage and everything else. This is totally in perfect condition and it's a superb game. I love the VR games, they're, they're just great arcade racers. And this one expands upon the arcade original by adding five courses instead of three and three types of vehicle. Really, really cool. Got a couple of DVDs. The Evil Dead, Bruce Campbell, original classic, and Red Dwarf Season 1. Red Dwarf, for you guys in the States, is a situation comedy based on a spaceship where this guy, Lister, is the sole living human being left in the universe. And that was done by a mishap with his cryogenic sleep chamber. He wakes up several thousands, I think it's thousands of years in the future, um, where his home cat had evolved into its own species, uh, his his annoying roommate from the past has been converted into a hologram, uh, the computer talks to him with a bit of sass. It sounds kind of lame when I talk about it, but it's a superb comedy, absolutely well worth watching. Instead of playing Rise of the Robots on PC. You all know about this game. I don't need to say a word about it, do I? It's garbage. How that survived. I wish this had died and Snatcher survived. 
Unfortunately, Snatcher for the Mega CD did not survive. <sighs> but this did. Damn it. Okay, moving on to some PC stuff. These are all uh, re-releases of PC classics. Dirt cheap, I remember picking these up for next to nothing. Um, so let's go through them. These are all factory sealed. Armor Command. Might and Magic 6, The Mandate of Heaven. Death Trap Dungeon, which is a lot like Tomb Raider, uh, funnily enough. Made by the same guys as Tomb Raider. Thief 2. The late, great Colin McRae's original game, Colin McRae Rally. Excessive Speed! The original Warcraft, Orcs and Humans. Grand Theft Auto London, in a standalone version. And Heroes of Might and Magic 3. That's the PC stuff out of the way. Okay. Are you ready? This is a PAL Dreamcast game. If you live in the PAL region, you know how delicate these stupid cases are. Fair Fighters for the Dreamcast, as you can see in that corner, got absolutely smashed. Let's check the disc. At least the disc is alright. I just need a new case. That's not so bad. Oh yeah, look, it's falling to pieces on me. It's just, it just comes apart at the seams. But the booklets, the catalogues, and everything else are all intact. So all that that needs is a new case, which I could probably pick up for a couple of quid. So that could have been a lot worse, to be fair. Something that looks like it's absolutely survived in one piece. Planet Ring with the microphone bundle for the Sega Dreamcast. So Planet Ring was an online based, uh, kind of like an MMO but mixed with mini games. Uh, you have these four mini games basically and you can play them with other people online um, and you can chat to them at the same time. It was keyboard compatible, VMU compatible and of course you could talk to people with your mic. Um, it's a bit tight because the box has been a little dented there. It's got a little bit of a dent so getting stuff out is tricky. Ah, come here you son of a bitch. It's not coming. <sighs> it's not coming. Jesus. Two hours later. There we go. Let's have a look. Still looks like it's in great condition. Yep, perfect condition. Everything's great with that. Happy days. So before I put that back in its box, let's have a look at the microphone, shall we? So, the Sega Dreamcast was one of the first ever consoles to have online play as standard. The early Japanese models didn't have a modem built in, but the US, uh, UK and later Japanese models had either a 28.8K modem, 33.6K modem or 56K modem built in. However, you could upgrade them. You can upgrade to broadband. You could buy a broadband adapter, um, which was much better for online gaming. However, you could play, because the network code was so great, you could play using these basic modems. And you could also use this micro microphone. Now, it doesn't look much like a microphone at this stage. In fact, it looks more like a VMU. It plugs into the controller like a standard VMU does. However, you have this microphone bit 
click that in and there's your mic. So you hold the controller like this and speak into it like, hello, how are you doing? And you could talk to other people online or you could talk to Seaman. If you've never played Seaman, I'm not going to explain it for you. It's um, The only thing I'm going to say is it's like a virtual pet with attitude and the rest you can look for yourself because Seaman has to be experienced first hand. Seaman is a phenomenal game and is worth buying a copy of Planet Ring just to get the microphone to play properly. Um, of course the servers for Planet Ring are long gone However, some heavy-duty backroom, backroom, bedroom coders people um, have released their own servers. And if you do a Google search, I'm sure you'll be able to find suitable addresses to use their services. And while you're online, why don't you check out Quake 3 Arena. This is the American version. It's still factory sealed. Quake 3 Arena on the Dreamcast was absolutely stunning. It had some Dreamcast exclusive levels as well as most of the major PC levels including the special camping ground level which is awesome. Probably one of the best uh, FPS versus shoot em up maze you know, maps um, of all time. Quake on the Dreamcast was phenomenal. It proved that you could do first person shooters with a single analog stick if thought out carefully. High octane, absolutely incredible. Plus, you could use a keyboard and mouse if you didn't want to use a controller. You simply plug in the keyboard in one port, plug in the mouse in the other, and away you go for multiplayer ecstasy. Factory sealed, I don't know how much that'll be worth, but it's, it's priceless for me. I love that game. Next on the list, another factory seal, NBA 2K2. Now, before uh, 2K Sports took over the, the 2K games, this was the king of the castle. This absolutely blew away NBA Live. It blew away all other competition. The 2K2 series by Sega Sports was absolutely mind-blowing back in the day and of course it evolved into the 2k series as you see nowadays with um with the the tape the 2k team um you can see its legacy beginning with these games this is i think the second nba game on the dreamcast uh, nba 2k game and it's just absolutely amazing to play especially in multiplayer you could play four players with this Four player online with a VGA cable with broadband with your vibration in one pack you know everything else in the other this was just a great experience for a, for a basketball fan if you were a sports fan though on Dreamcast you didn't have a lot of choice when it came to football I don't mean NFL American football I mean soccer football um, you had GK I think it was goal killers or, or something like that and you had 90 minutes Sega Championship football I don't think there were any other football games a oh, virtuous striker but that's more of an arcade game I have a white label promo only copy of 90 minutes Sega Championship football this was handed to me in person by the guys at Sega at a trade show so this is my personal copy um, it's cool it says sample only uh, in silver you probably can't read that but it says sample only however this is the complete finalized game and I'm so glad it survived because white labels are hard to come by something else that survived even though I didn't really care if it did or not Mortal Kombat Gold which is the Sega Dreamcast version of the mediocre Mortal Kombat 4 let's see yeah, it seems absolutely hunky-dory, manual spotless, it's it's perfect condition, except for a slight crack on the back. Um, yeah, Mortal Kombat 4 didn't exactly set the world on fire, it was, um, it was very primitive 3D, um, and the engine just couldn't cope with a decent fighting game. It's a shame, a bit too early, I think, for a 3D fighter. Mortal Kombat 5? started to get a lot better and then by the time Mortal Kombat 7 came around and then of course Mortal Kombat 9 and 10 uh, the 3D fighting had been perfected and 
the games really showed off how special they could be in 3D. This one didn't quite hit the mark. Speaking of marks, Shadow Man and the Mark of the Dead. He stalks criminals in the spirit world and the real world. There's a voodoo mask in his chest. He's a possessed man. Shadow Man is coming, trailing evil from live side to dev side. Dead son. To stop an apocalypse. I can't speak. Fuck. To stop an apocalypse. To save your soul. And it was a it was a pretty good game. You could tell it used the um, Tomb Raider style engine. There are a lot of similarities in terms of platforming between this and Tomb Raider. A lot of comparisons were made. Shadow Man's interesting, but it's not memorable. Um, aside from the main character and the, the areas, the gameplay itself was kind of middle of the road. Worth it if you can find it cheap though. Confidential mission for the Dreamcast. A light gun game, I thought when this was released, this was basically Virtual Cop 3. Um, just with a different name. They did go on to make a proper Virtual Cop 3 game in the future, but that never came out for Dreamcast. This is James Bond Virtual Cop style. Um, it's, it's just fantastic. High octane, very fast, very fluid, keeps you on your toes throughout the entire game. Lots of enemies to shoot and very little reflex time to shoot them in. It's balls to the wall, white knuckle excitement from start to finish. I love Confidential Mission. Another sealed Dreamcast game, Caesar's Palace 2000, which is a gambling simulator of Caesar's Palace, of course. Another sealed Dreamcast game, Wild Metal. Now, this one was a uh, yeah, DMA design game. Guys who did Grand Theft Auto made this game. Uh, Rockstar uh, were involved. Um, you can play single player or you could have head to head death matches in this kind of uh, tank based shooter. Um, pretty cool game. I've got the American copy as well, which I've played a bit. It ran off Windows CE, and Dreamcast games that ran off Windows CE had frame rate problems, but you know, still a good game, still worth checking out. Tomb Raider Chronicles for the Dreamcast. This feels a bit light. No, the disc's in there. And the book is basically a pamphlet. This one, um, Tomb Raider Chronicles, uh, Lara Cross missing in Egypt. She's presumed dead. So you do like a, a recollection of previous missions. Stuff that led up to where she is now. Kind of like a, almost like a return to the original game. Uh, but not quite. It wasn't a remake. It was a, a progression. Um, but for me, I'd lost interest in Tomb Raider by this point. The game just did nothing for me. It's a shame. Adrian! Adrian! It's, it's the Rocky box set containing all five Rocky movies. Of course, this is way before Rocky Balboa got released. Um, this, I believe, is actually an American import. Yes, it is. It's an American import. I got this from the USA um, because there was nothing like it on the UK DVDs at the time. Really pleased to have this. I love my Rocky films. I have since upgraded to Blu-ray copies, but yes, yeah, still, still great. If you've not watched the entire Rocky series, I recommend you do. They're uh, they're great, entertaining movies. So, on to Sega Mega Drive. Psh. Yes, you may recognise this from my top 50 Sega Mega Drive games of all time. It is June 2: Battle for Arrakis. Now, I put this as my number two game of all time, and when you play it, it's easy to see why. This is the predecessor to Command & Conquer. The guys who did Command & Conquer made this game, and this is a real-time strategy, uh, which is very rare for the Sega Mega Drive. And to see a console RTS done so brilliantly and with such care for its control scheme is, is incredible, especially this early on 
in computer generations and game generations. Dune 2 Battle of Arrakis, absolute must have if you're a fan of strategy games. Virtua Racing also made my top 50 Sega Mega Drive games of all time. Not quite in as high a place as Dune 2 did, but this is honourable for many reasons. It was the most expensive Sega Mega Drive game you could buy. I think it was like £90 when it came out. It was on the biggest cartridge that you could buy. <laughs> Let me just get my Dune 2 back. Look at the size of this bad boy. Okay, so, this is June, this is Virtua Racing. It's huge, it's nearly two, two cartridges in size. And it's also the only game that has the Sega Virtual Processor on board, the SVP chip. This was Sega's answer to the Super FX chip in the Super Nintendo that allowed the humble Sega Mega Drive to throw polygons around at breakneck speeds. Virtual Racing, as a result, is a really, really respectable conversion. Considering the hardware it's running on, you've got to have this in your collection. If Even if it's purely for a curio, me personally, I love the way that Virtual Racing plays. Uh, the way the cars handle is right up my alley. Uh, I love it. It's great. Something else I love, and a lot of people love it with me, Road Rash 2. Now this didn't make my top 50 list for one reason and one reason only. That reason is Road Rash 3. <laughs> um, Road Rash 2, however, is a very respectable game. It's a superb sequel to the original. It takes everything that you know and love about Road Rash and, and basically turns the dial on it. Um, you've got more weapons that you can use, faster vehicles, a higher frame rate, multiplayer mode this time around. Yes, you can race head to head with a friend and punch his face in. Absolutely great. And this is another game that you can punch your friend's face in and smile while you do it. My number one Sega Mega Drive game of all time is Speedball 2. This is the UK version, and the UK version is slightly different to the Japanese version which I specified on my list. The Japanese version has a few bug fixes and it has music playing throughout the game. The UK version doesn't have music, it just has sound effects while you play the actual matches. And it's got a couple of bugs, but it's still one of the greatest two-player games of all time. Speedball 2 in career mode or in league mode, you can sit there all day and all night long with a pal, play the living crap out of this and never get bored. I love the art direction, I love the style, I love the, the visuals, the, the impact that your players have, the strategical elements that you have with, with training up your players, um, it's, it's, just, it's just a hell of a game. I know a lot of people mocked me and decided that Speedball 2 was invalid as a number one. I disagree. I think that you're all invalid for disagreeing with me. Speedball 2 kicks ass. Right, 3DO. D for the 3DO. D, this is the Japanese version. D is a full motion video interactive horror film where you play this girl called Lara, I believe her name was, and you have two hours to find out what's happening in the world around you. Um, there's lots of creepy goings on in this, this uh, secret house. Um, and I don't remember a great deal of the story itself. I think your father died and you're trying to figure out what happened to him. And spoilers, it turns out that you killed him because you're a freaking vampire lady. <laughs> yeah, spoilers. It doesn't actually ruin any of the enjoyment of the game though. And it looks like this version comes with a poster. Wow, what a useless poster that is. Can you see that? And on the back, it's also doubling up as your instruction booklet. There are some really cool puzzles to solve. 
some really cool, shockingly gory visuals for the time. The pre-rendered graphics, the, the full motion video 3D was, was well, it was, it was fantastic. Um, it was released on a whole bevy of systems, PlayStation, 3DO, Sega Saturn, PC. Um, and it's, it's one of my favourite games of this style. So good, in fact, that I bought the English copy too. And the German one. This is actually the German copy, which is slightly different. Um, of course, Germany has some heavy sensors um, throughout their games. So I thought it would be interesting to check out D on the on the German version to see what changes there were. Turns out not a lot. Surprisingly enough, early FMV games. Woof, there's still some pretty brutal imagery in this one. Let me tell you. And um, still, I'm really glad to have it in my collection. Blade Force, and I don't believe I've ever got round to playing this. Have I played this before? No, I haven't. In fact, it's still sealed. So, um, yeah, I've never, never actually tried that one. I'll have to give that a go. Tell you what I think. I've got the 3DO hooked up to the TV behind me, so uh, yeah, I'm going to try that later. Starfighter. Unfortunately, it's suffered a bit of damage. The box is cracked, but uh, everything else looks intact. Great. This was um, a flight-based combat game. Pretty decent graphics for the time. Ran at a fair lick too, the, the frame rate was smooth, but it had nothing on the next game. Probably my favourite 3DO game of all time. It's a bit grubby, so I'm going to give it a quick clean up while we chat. Can't have this looking anything less than its best for the camera, because this game is super. Wing Commander, that is. Yeah, Super Wing Commander. Absolutely brilliant. Wing Commander is one of my favourite series of, of aerial combat games. Super Wing Commander just is essentially a remake of the first game with better visuals, with full 3D graphics, and it's absolutely stunning. I love this game to death. This is the reason, along with Street Fighter, that I bought a 3DO. It's absolutely amazing. And you could only buy this for the 3DO and for the Macintosh. It never came out on PC or any other system. Really love this game. If you get a chance to play it, by all means, please do. Right, next one. Syndicate. Now, this is not the original box. Unfortunately, the original box was lost a long time ago. It was one of these big cardboard things and in my idiocy I threw it away and I just made this quick replica jewel case which has now gone the way of the dodo however it kind of fits in with the style of the, the disc itself this is a legitimate 3DO game look at the poor print job on that look at how poor it is you can barely make out the wording that is a legitimate retail release game how shocking is that Good job the game itself is of absolutely highest quality though. It's a strategical isometric game set in the future, set in a, ver set in a very cynical future where corporations rule the world, sounds a bit like now to be honest, um, and you are mercenaries for hire. You can build out your team, uh, you can give them cybernetic enhancements, you can give them guns, you can give them persuadatron chips that they inject into human beings, civilians, that allow you to control them and get them to do your bidding. Uh, it was it was an incredible game, it was uh, revolutionary back when it was first released on the Amiga in the early 90s, and the 3DO version is basically a straight port of that. Um, rather than have mouse controls though, it uses the, the controller, uh, but the controller is cleverly realised for the controls um, and, and it doesn't hamper your enjoyment of the game in any way. So we have one last 3DO game before we move on to other systems. Space Pirates, one of my few surviving long box games, although it has seen better days. This seems like it got damaged with the damp a little bit. Um, this is a full motion video 
shooting game. Uh, it's a gallery shooter, much like Mad Dog McCree, that kind of game. Um, not much can be said about it. It's cheesy fun, but not as cheesy or as fun as something like Ground Zero Texas was on the Mega CD, which is very similar, but in my opinion, a lot better, a lot more fun. Um, yeah, the box has seen better days, but the disc looks okay. So hopefully that will still run on my 3DO. Time will tell. Okay, so now we are moving on. Now we're going into the realms of the obscure systems. Well, not really obscure, just less talked about, I guess. The first game off the bat, Starblade for the Mega CD. Starblade is an on-rail shooter that's very reminiscent of the uh, old Star Wars arcade games. Um, one of my favourite on-rail shooter games of all time. The Mega CD version couldn't quite cope with the revolutionary graphics of the arcade original back in the 90s, so it uses wireframe graphics for a lot of its visuals. And I kind of prefer that. It's, um, it's weird. Less is more sometimes, and it leaves more to your imagination. Um, and I really like the visual style of this Mega CD game. Um, yeah, it's really good. And it's cheap. If you wanted to buy a copy, you can pick one up for less than 10 quid. Um, and I recommend you do. Okay, um, let's go for PlayStation next. This is a game I've never heard anybody talk about before in the history of my video gaming career. This is a game called World Tennis Stars for the PlayStation. Um, from what I gather, this is an extremely rare game. I don't know why. Um, on second thoughts, I do know why. It seems like it was released in 2003. That is extremely late for a PlayStation 1 title. That is well into the PlayStation 2's lifespan. Um, from what I can gather, it's a straightforward tennis game. I don't know if you can see the screenshots there because they're tiny. But yes, it's just a, a straightforward tennis game with tennis courts all around the world. You've got grass, beach, stone, courtyard, disco, Mayan temple, or even a New York street apparently. whoop de doo Okay, Common as Muck, Dragon Ball Z Legend uh, for the Japanese PlayStation 1. The box, uh, it's, it's kind of damaged, which is a shame, but I can always replace that as long as the game is intact. The spine card is, which is always good. And the disc is perfect. Great. Okay, so I just need to replace the case on that one. That's not too bad. This is a 2D fighting game uh, that you could use uh, four players for. You could have two human players against two computer players um, and a great big battle royale, which was kind of unique for the PlayStation. Very rare to, to see a game like that because of the, uh, the PlayStation's limited RAM. Less difficult to see and much more common. Tenchu, the Stealth Assassins. This is the American copy. Um, Tenchu was great. A stealth 3D action game um, where you basically live by honor, kill by stealth. You could climb rooftops, you had to sneak your way around. You couldn't make a scene, you couldn't kill enemies that you didn't, um, you didn't have to for the mission. Otherwise you alert guards and guards bring dogs and then you have to drop cow drops or food or something to distract them while you escape. Really good game. Teaches you how to be sneaky. Graphics have not aged well at all, by the way, but it's still a good game. What isn't a good game though, and the graphics have aged terribly, is the CDI version of The Seventh Guest. So, this is an interactive movie that you needed the FMV cartridge for. Uh, and the idea of this game is uh, basically you get invited into this haunted house, you and five other guests, and 
you know, there's this, this toy maker in there and a series of puzzles. And you have to figure out through these puzzles who the seventh guest is. Um, there is a secret seventh guest um, and you have to solve the mystery behind that. Sounds better than I explain it. It really is a better game than I explain. However, it's aged terribly. Um, it's very chunky, very choppy, very slow. But the puzzles are pretty good, so if you've got patience, you probably still could enjoy that. Okay, totally tubular, man. It's Demo's quest for the CDI man. Yeah, you can tell this has got Nike's tune all over it. I mean, he's got his baseball cap on back to front. He's riding a skateboard, dude. And he's got his shorts and his puffer jacket, man. Oh, yeah. Gnarly. Um, I'm going to stop embarrassing myself now. Basically, this is a puzzle game. You've got 51 levels throughout this. Um, and you have to, basically, just get to the exit of each level. Collect the stuff get to the end. How original. It's, it's not the best game either, but you start for choice on the CDI, really. Any game you have to pick up, um, purely because most of them are garbage. But there we go. That is it for this, uh, this unboxing, uh, except for this one music CD. Static X. The Wisconsin Death Trip. Now, Wayne Static from Static X is no longer with us. This is kind of a, a hectic metal stroke. Um, kind of. How do you explain it? It's basically metal uh, with a kind of heavy beat on top. Lots of screaming, lots of shouting. Pretty cool back in the day. As you can see, I reserved this copy in 1999 from my local music shop back when there were local music shops do you remember those that was bought from number 19 back in 99 number 19 was a very famous shop from my neck of the woods um, where i live in my island number 19 was this massive emporium for music <laughs> or massive to us anyway um, and i learned of many new artists and many new sounds uh, just by walking in seeing something interesting picking it up and giving it a go the guys there were really cool if you asked them what their opinion was on something they'd tell you if they thought it was shit or not and I really appreciated that so they got repeat business from me over and over and over again the amount of CDs I bought from that place is incredible um, of course now nobody buys CDs anymore it's all digital anyway that is the end of Memory Lane. That is the end of this series of show and tell. I don't know what I'm going to call this series. I mean, it's not really an unboxing because this is stuff I already owned. It's like a re-unboxing. Maybe a runboxing. I don't know. By the time you watch this video, I'll have figured it out because it will be in the title description. So you know I don't. Something you know that I don't, which is cool. Um, until then, I'll bid you adieu. Bye for now.